Strass Vete and welcome back to Tom's World Scale Model Series. In this episode, we paint and weather our Trumpeter KV-1 heavy tank. If you enjoy programming on scale modeling, then show your support by subscribing to this channel. Leave us a comment, like, dislike, or share the video with friends. Clicking the notification bell gives you alerts when we post new content. Or visit the channel Tom's World for a friendly visit for a complete list of all our videos. We made good progress in our build episode. In general, the kit fell together easily, but we did encounter a few structural gaps. Also, practically every part had flash, indicative of overworked molds that are burdened with churning out the expansive line of KVs that Trumpeter produces. Still, the tank reflects Soviet production philosophy. The vehicle's no-nonsense, infinitely utilitarian design makes for a model with large, simple forms, relatively few parts, and straightforward construction. So stick with us as we bring our sleeping colossus to life with painting and weathering. In our episode 1 build video, we managed to get all our major sub-assemblies done and we got the rest of our loose parts cleaned up. But before we can progress, we still have a few last minute touches to finish before we can begin painting. The kit's machine guns are the smallest I've ever worked with. They're solid and I considered hollowing them out. I recently bought this drill bit set for my pin vise and I was itching to put it to good use. The smallest bit in the set is a number 80 gauge that's 0 0.0135 inches or 0.34 millimeters and it's not much thicker than a hair. But when sized up with a machine gun, disappointingly, even this tiny bit is too large to drill these guns. We encountered these gaps in the horizontal and vertical front plates earlier in the build. These plates and the hull sides on the real KV-1 are welded together, so we'll fill these gaps with weld beads. We make our weld beads out of stretched sprue. The process was demonstrated here in our Kuba Wagon build video. We then apply a little liquid cement over the slit and carefully place our stretch sprue over the gap. The sprue is pressed down firmly to create a good joint. It's important that the diameter of our little fillet is wider than our gap so it doesn't get pushed down into the crevice. Next, the bead is flooded with thin model cement to soften it. We can then press little weld patterns into the fillet. Here I'm using a blunt toothpick, but a hobby knife blade works just as well. My fillet isn't quite soft enough in this shot, and several more coats of thin cement were needed. Still, this gives us a reasonably decent depiction of the technique. To get the right shape, we can refer to pictures of real weld beads as seen here. And here's the finished look before painting. During our build, we noticed a few other gaps that needed to be filled before we can paint. We don't want to miss this little gap on the fender stiffeners. To fill gaps like these, we can use traditional filler products like Mr. Surfacer or acrylic putty like this Filego product, but lately I've been using good old PVA white glue. I like using white glue since it's non-toxic and cleans up with water. We can also thin the glue with water to a perfect consistency which we can apply with a brush. White glue doesn't shrink as it dries like some fillers, but it does settle, so sometimes more than one coat is required. The only drawback is that white glue dries clear, so it's hard to tell how good our filler work is until we paint. We get a feel for how much to apply with experience. We'll use bamboo shish kebab skewers to mount our wheels for painting. I'll remove the sharp end so I don't stick myself, and I usually cut the stick into shorter pieces. We can then carve the end down if the stick is too thick. Mounting the wheel this way makes it easy to spray paint all its sides. The stick also masks the interior mounting hole. We'll see why that's advantageous a bit later. For wheels with mounting holes larger than our skewer, we can create a shim by wrapping masking tape around the skewer's end. We can then poke the skewers into styrofoam or cardboard. This is a convenient way to hold our wheels while they dry after we spray them. Parts that we can't mount on skewers, like these towing cables, can be held with sticky side-up masking tape mounted on card. 
We also mask off the posts where the wheels will be attached. We could use CA or even epoxy to attach the wheels, but I prefer using model glue. Model glue dries fairly slowly, so we have time to maneuver the wheels into alignment once we stick them on. Also, bare plastic joints set with model glue are very strong, so once we set our wheels, they should stay straight. For my undercoat, I mixed up a raw steel color using brown, black, and red enamel model paint. We can add a touch of white if the color is too dark. I cut the enamel paint about 50-50 with mineral spirits and give the entire model a nice smooth solid coat. I used to me acrylics SF67 NATO green lightened with XF60 dark yellow for the main green color. I'll give this base coat at least overnight to fully harden, then everything gets a layer of acrylic gloss clear coat. When I examined the road wheels prior to painting, if assembled, their inner surfaces would be very hard to spray. Pre-painting the wheels prior to assembly helps us avoid touch-ups later. I was careful to spray only the front and back faces of the wheels, leaving the dark steel undercoat on the edges. I then mixed together little gunmetal and old rust pigment powders and rubbed the pigments on the wheel edges with a makeup applicator brush. This gives us a nice raw steel color with a light patina of rust. I was careful not to totally cover the steel colored undercoat. If we look closely, we can see patches of the dark gray poking through. This gives the impression of warm paint. The varying color tones help to break up the otherwise flat panels. This creates depth and variety to their surfaces. With our base color on, it's now a good time to check our filling work. The weld beads on the front horizontal and vertical plates look good, as did the gap on the front angle nose plate. In these shots, we can compare the before and after. Time to get our decals on. The tank has no markings other than the slogans on the turret sides. If we look closely, we see a lot of carrier film around the large lettering. I'm almost paranoid about silvering and other decal vagaries. And looking at the product shots on the trumpeter box, this decal work didn't exactly instill confidence. Where practical, I trimmed away as much excess carrier film as possible. Cutting out our letters does make working with the fragile transfers more challenging, and we don't get the built-in spacing that the carrier film would otherwise provide. We keep the decals moistened so we can reposition them if needed. And we constantly refer to the instructions for proper placement and alignment. I always use decal softener even when applying decals to flat surfaces. This Microsoft product works well, but any comparable brand will do. We flood the decals with two to three coats, allowing each to dry in between. We can then go in with a cotton swab and firmly press and roll the decals to remove any air bubbles. When using a cotton swab, make sure to clean off any cotton fibers that may stick to the surfaces. Otherwise, the hairs are near impossible to remove once sprayed with a gloss coat. And here's the finished look before gloss coating. I was curious about the slogan's English translation and my friends on social media were kind enough to translate. This gives us some sense of how profoundly bitter the Russo-German conflict actually was. Oil paints are great for weathering models. We'll use a number of colors on our KV. This includes burnt umber, black, white, brown, yellow ochre, sap green, and burnt sienna. We'll also apply this light sienna pigment powder to our model later, so we mix up a small batch of oil colors to match it. The tone is achieved by mixing burnt umber, yellow ochre, and a touch of white and sap green. As always, our weathering starts with streaking. 
We've covered the process in detail in other videos, so just a brisk run through here. Next on is our pin wash. And here's the look so far after blending our pin wash. We can see how the oil streaking helps to dull the decals while producing those subtle lines of discoloration that mimics water runoff. As always, we'll use our favorite trio of pigment powders for our lower hull, that being light sienna, dark mud, and light dust. And we don't want to forget to flick spots with diluted oils and pigments. And here's the look we're after. We breeze through the process here, but for a more detailed look at these hull weathering techniques, you can check out our Hummel or FT-17 build videos. With our lower hull weathered, we can now pull the masking tape off the wheel connector rods. We can now glue our wheels on, except for the drive sprocket. We'll look at why we don't glue the drive sprocket on in a minute. Time to tackle the tracks. As our unboxing revealed, the rubber bands were pretty much a write-off. The styrene link and length tracks were nicely detailed and sagged, but they had nasty pushpin scars all over the inner surfaces. I did clean up the singles and short lengths, but the long runs were a bit too labor intensive for my tastes. I did clean up the outermost edge, the edge that's noticeable, and opted to cover the rest of the pock marks with weathering. We start by pressing the tracks together dry. We then flood the loose link joints with liquid model cement. We use a generous amount of glue. We let the glue set up for about 5 to 10 minutes so the links stay together but the tracks stay pliable. We then gently slip them over the wheels. We don't glue the drive sprocket on so we can rotate it and feed the track into place. If we were to glue the sprocket on it would be very difficult if not impossible to slip the tracks into place. It also allows us to ensure the sprocket teeth engage the spaces on the tracks. We then gently wrap the tracks around the wheels.
We can then jam bits of rolled up paper towel or toothpicks to press the tracks against the wheels to get the right shape. We give the tracks at least two hours of drying time to fully harden. The tracks are then removed and they get a coat of enamel paint. I mix the color using brown, black and a touch of red and white. Our tracks get the same pigment powder treatment as a lower hull. We can then reinstall the tracks and tack them in place using CA glue. Our wheels get weathered next and we repeat the same dry pigment application as our hull. This odd bracket arm is unique to the KV. We encountered it in our build episode and at the time it was a bit of a head scratcher. Turns out it's a scraper which prevents mud from building up on the inside of the sprocket. Excess buildup can strain the drive and can cause the track to slip off. We can enhance the dark areas with oil paint using a raw umber color heavily darkened with black. We use a large soft brush to blend and feather the edges. This replicates the look of raw metal where the paint is rubbed off. We create highlights, sun fading and warm panels by repeating the blending with a very light color. Here I'm using my light sienna oil color lightened with a little bit of white. The air intake mesh is painted with diluted black oil, then it's dry brushed with a near white oil. Although the mesh is solid styrene, we did achieve a convincing wire-like look. And finally we can attach our stray pieces, the stowage bins, gun swab canister, towing cables and clevises, our rear lamp and its overlapping mud guard. And we can't forget to paint our exhaust pipes with rusty pigments and black oil paint. This trumpeter kit is a solid choice for anyone looking to add a KV-1 heavy tank to their collection, especially if working on a budget since its moderate $40 Canadian price makes it very affordable. The parts do have flash and a little filling was needed to address the gaps on the front slope. The kit does come with clear parts and a one-piece slide molded barrel. But features found in more premium kits such as figures and photo etch are lacking. But other than its few tiny parts, the large forms and straightforward build-up make it an easy and fun project for builders of any skill level. Since the KV was a no-nonsense utilitarian design which eschewed aesthetics in favor of ease of manufacture and operation, we therefore kept our painting and weathering simple, in keeping with the function over form philosophy that inspired the tank's design. In other words, the vehicle wasn't built to be pretty, it was built to fight, and by all appearances our finished model would look right at home on any battlefield. And that'll do it for this episode. If you haven't already, please subscribe to the channel or click the like button or just drop us a note in the comments. Otherwise, visit the channel Tom's World for a listing of all our entertaining and educational videos. In the meantime, keep building and improving your skills. Stay well and all the best. Since the KV was a no-nonsense utilitary design which ensued aesthetics in favor of ease of design, manufacture and operation, 